G-Man Boxing. Do you know what I mean? Every single live he donates. I see him on other lives donating, donating, donating. He's got the bag on it. All right, people. Review of the week time. So, let's start this off with the two cards that happened last night. Because there was... Look, I'm going to talk about the Misfit show. I'll talk about that now in a sec. But let's start with F.A. Jagba versus Sebastian Sean. Now, F.A. Jagba got the win last night. Now, a lot of people were saying Sebastian Sean is actually a pretty decent boxer. He's known as Big Shot. And... The, the fight was close. I really didn't have an issue with F.A. Ajagba getting the decision. But from what I've seen, and I seem to have been saying this for a while now, you know, Ajagba came onto a lot of people's radar. Probably would have been about 2017, 2018. I remember when he, I can't remember the guy he fought. God scares me, but he knocked him out in about 30 seconds with a big right hand. This was before he fought Curtis Harper and he walked out of the ring when the bell went. And Ajagba, he... He looked like someone who, you know, you can clearly tell has tremendous power. But very upright, very robotic, very stiff in his movement. And just n not a fluid fighter at all. You could just see that. But that was a couple of years back. Now, I knew Jagba had, you know, he didn't win anything major as an amateur. But he had an amateur background with him. So, it wasn't like we were dealing with someone who was just a fish out of water. He had a bit of experience coming from the amateurs. So, I kind of thought, okay, if this guy can be maneuvered right... He could do something if we could improve him. And he was trained. No, that was Frank Sanchez. I was thinking of. I was going to say Eddie Renault. That was Frank Sanchez who beat FA Jagba. But I was kind of thinking if he could be trained properly and you can get him a bit more fluid, then we could be onto something here because he clearly has punching power. I mean, that we can't even argue. He clearly has that. But for the last, I want to say, three years, it's been much of the same with FA Jagba. You know, he's had a couple of big knockouts you know big knockout wins but he's had other fights where he's looked vulnerable where he's looked how would i describe a pedestrian almost and he looked pedestrian at times in this fight you know sebastian shaw he's not a bad fighter i do feel as though he didn't pace himself the best in this fight i think he faded a bit down the stretch which gave a jagba the chance to gain the upper hand the scorecards one scorecard was reported was but well, I was seeing different things. So on the ESPN feed, they were saying it was all 96, 94. But one scorecard was apparently 97, 94. Um, I did see a picture of the scorecards, but I didn't actually check it. I just was like, I was kind of clicking. I was like, okay, scorecards didn't check it. I should have really checked it. But a bit all over. But Sebastian Shaw didn't really, there was no issue with him after the fight. It wasn't like he was protesting the decision from what I could see. It was one of those fights. Like, I don't have an issue with someone giving it to a Jagba. I don't have an issue with someone giving it to Sebastian Sean, to be honest with you. It was just... It, it wasn't a great fight, truth be told. It was kind of... It was one of those fights where, like, you, you thought maybe it might catch fire. And it was just like, meh. You know, so it was just kind of... It was just like... That was kind of it. it. It just it went and it went by. So that was the story with that fight. In terms of what both guys do... I really don't know how you fix F.A. Jag, but to be honest with you, you know, I've been saying this for a few years. I, I think that he certainly has power, and that will always keep him in the equation, you know, in terms of heavyweights, you know, someone like that who can land it. But I'm not going to hold out much hope in F.A. Jag, but long term, to be honest with you. Sebastian Sean, I mean, yeah, he lost this fight, but a couple of improvements to stamina. I mean, it could have someone who could be... I don't want to say he'd make it into the top 10 or anything like that, but he'd certainly be a guy who he caused a few people problems. And he might be one of those guys where, a bit like a Frank Sanchez actually, where it's just like, I'm not going to have to fight him unless I absolutely have to. Maybe to a lesser extent than that, because Sanchez is a lot better, in my opinion, than Sebastian. I was saying Sebastian. Stephen Sean. Hope I, Sebastian, why did that name come into my mind? Hope I haven't been saying that too much. Stephen Sean. I don't know where that name came into my head from, but Ao, Stephen Sean. Don't know why I was saying that. Um, yeah, I think Frank Sanchez is a better fighter. So that's kind of how both guys went. I did get a chance to look at the Guido Valle Vanilo. 
against Jonathan Rice. Now, I've seen this guy Guido Valino before and never really impressed me too much, truth be told. He had a draw. Who was it he had the draw against? And a lot of people felt like he was fortunate to get this draw. A guy called Kingsley Ibeck. Now, he's since actually taken an L against Jared Anderson, this guy. But a lot of people, I remember that at the time. I think that was, it was back in 2020. I can't remember what card it was on. It might have been on the um, Lomachenko Lopez card. I can't remember which one, but it was October or November 2020. A lot of people felt he lost that fight. In this one, he was winning. You know, he was doing what he needed to do against Jonathan Rice. But he got hit by a big right hand by Jonathan Rice, who actually opened a cut over his eye. And the referee wanted to call it an accidental cut, an accidental clash of heads, which was bizarre. Because that really, that reeks of the old C word. You know, that's what that reeked of. When it was so clear that a cut was caused by a punch. And the referee goes, no, was it? But that reeked of some, you know what. But thankfully it was overturned. It is now a TKO victory for Jonathan Rice, as it so well should be. So Jonathan Rice, back-to-back -back wins over Michael Coffey. He's been out of the ring for a year. I'm surprised about that, actually. You know, he fought Michael Coffey um, New Year's Day last year. So out of the ring for a year. I didn't even realize that now, actually. That's crazy, because um, Jonathan Rice, his record is not amazing, but he's... Jonathan Rice is better than his record suggests. You know, if you were to look at Jonathan Rice, you would say that, if you were to compare him, I should say, to heavyweights of old, in terms of someone who didn't have a great record but was a lot better, he's he's not as good as this guy, but he's kind of like a Buster Douglas, if you know what I mean. Like Buster Douglas is better than Jonathan Rice. He had ability, but he just lacked heart. The chin was never the best and, you know, kind of things like that. So his record was a lot worse than it actually is. His record made him look worse than he is, and it's similar with Jonathan Rice. He's better than that record suggests. He can spring these upsets like that. You know, and he's actually done a bit of performing. Now that's three back-to-back -back wins now he's had. They aren't too bad. So, yeah, Jonathan Rice, he's earning himself more paydays with that. I wouldn't mind seeing Anderson go in there with Rice, to be honest with you. And it might be something that Bob Aaron would look at. Jared Anderson now it might be something he'd look at. Because if he can get past someone like Jonathan Rice and do it well... I've, you know me, I think very highly of Jared Anderson, but um, that could really be an asset test for him. Going in there against someone like Jonathan Rice and coming out with a win. Because Jonathan Rice is tough. If if you are have any chinks in your armour, he's the sort of opponent who would find you out. You know, he probably, people say Sakalowski and people like that. He's a level above all them, you know. So if you're trying to get to world level and you have the chinks in your armour, someone like Jonathan Rice is going to find you out. In my opinion, anyway, so... That was the top rank show that was on last night. Obviously, we talked about the Misfits card. So, I only seen a couple of cards on that Misfits card. I didn't watch a lot of it. I watched KSI's win. And as I said in my post-fight review, you know, I'm asking the question in this video, is it good or bad, YouTube boxing? And I was taken aback by how packed the Wembley Arena was. You know, I've been in there before. I've never seen it as packed. And... In a fortnight's time, it's going to be Yard versus Paterbiev. And I ask you in the comments, do you think it'll be as packed for that fight? I love Yard Paterbiev. I think it's a great fight. I know a lot of other people think it's a good fight. We're all looking forward to it. But do you think it's going to be as packed in there as it was last night? At the end of the day, boxing is a form of entertainment. And there's entertainment to be had at all levels. Whether you're talking about small hall shows, which aren't even televised whether it's the big massive cards in Vegas or London or this YouTube boxing, at the end of the day, they're all forms of entertainment. And I want to be entertained. There was a few fights on that card that entertained me. And when I look at how big a turnout there was, and I've seen it in the comment section, people were agreeing with me. My whole point on YouTube boxing is it's, it's here. It's likely to stay. If you don't like it, don't watch it. You know, so... It's, it's something I've never understood. It's it's really it's really weird. I just find it strange. It's like it's not just boxing. It's it's things in general. It's like imagine there's a podcast you don't like, right? Say he talks about psychology, and you just you know you, you know enough about psychology. You know this guy's talking absolute out of his arse. So why watch him if it's gonna peeve you off? Would you not just not watch him? Let him do his own thing, and you watch someone who you do like. It's a bit like that with YouTube boxing. 
if you don't like it, that's fine. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. There are going to be people out there who won't like it. That's understandable. Me, I don't mind it personally. I wouldn't be going and paying however much the zone were paying. I didn't pay for it. I um, wasn't going to. But if there's nothing else on and I might know some of the guys that I just as in to watch on YouTube and stuff, I'd be like, yeah, why not? I'll have a look. You know, what's the worst that can happen? Some people don't like it. That's fine. But... I don't understand why they'll be moaning about it, you know, tweeting about it and saying, I'm watching this and it's terrible, oh, this is disgraceful. It's, why are you watch it? If you, don't, if, you, if you know you're not going to like it, why are you going to watch it? Just just don't. Just, if you don't like it, just don't watch it. For me, I've said it once, I'll say it again. I cannot look at YouTube boxing and not think this is a good thing because it's bringing eyes to the sport. And for me, that's the most important thing. It's bringing eyes on the sport of boxing because it will inevitably trickle down into the real thing, into the real pro game. And that's a good thing because, as I said in that video, the hardcore fans, they're the minority. We're all in the minority. Those who are watching this video, who watch me, Jamie, Chris, Outmatch, just to name a few, we're the minority, right? It's the casuals who fill these arenas, who fill these stadiums, who get the majority of these viewing figures. It's the casuals who do all that. So without them, these fighters are goosed. They won't be getting big paydays. The networks won't be carrying boxing. They won't be pushing it as much. Without them, the whole operation falls to you know what. So we need them. And if this is putting more eyes on it, and it's going to get people into you know, the smaller shows, you know, the Sky shows, the Zone shows, etc., the normal Zone shows, is that not a good thing? I think it is. You know, And I've said it once, I'll say it again sooner or later in the next decade or so you're going to have someone come around they might win well hopefully boxing is in the olympics but they might win olympic gold or they might win a world title they could be from the uk they could be from wherever london will say they'll get interviewed what inspired you to go into boxing when i watch ksi fight that whatever the hell his name was temper or something like that or when i watch jake paul fight your know, tyron woodley and i don't think that's a bad thing and i look it's not going to surprise me if that does happen wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. And again, at the end of the day, it's getting eyes on the sport. You know, I've told this story several times. People have asked me what got me into boxing. And I'll always tell them it was my friend showed me clips of Muhammad Ali, but not Muhammad Ali fighting. He was actually showing me the clips of Muhammad Ali trash talking. That was back in 2012. I was about 18. Now, at that time, my two sports were F1 and football in that order. And... I had watched boxing. I knew who Floyd Mayweather was, Manny Pacquiao, Ricky Hatton, etc. I knew the fighters of the past, Mike Tyson, Ali. I knew them. But in terms of the, the wider aspect, I was a bona fide casual. And my friend and me went for a spin. And he had, um, like, my friend was terrible. Like, he'd be driving like that, watching videos on his phone. And he still does it. Like, he'd be just like, have you seen this video? Uh huh. Yeah, he was just, he still does that now, actually. But he showed me a few clips of Muhammad Ali trash talking. And... I just found it entertaining. I knew who Ali was, but I ended up going home that night watching more of Ali trash talk, and it was like, oh, this is this guy's fun. So eventually I started watching his fights. I started watching his fights with Frazier, with Norton, with Foreman. I started watching more of Norton and Foreman's fights, not just Ali, just in general. Then I, I, I kind of went backwards. So I started watching Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis, Max Baer, Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney, etc. You know, did, I was looking at the history, you know, Jim Corp, but John L. Sullivan, Jay Kilrain under the London Prize fighting rules, going back that far. Before eventually, uh, I think the first real kind of fight I watched, which was kind of a, a big, big ish fight, it wasn't really a big fight, but it was a big name, was Canelo when he fought Lopez, before he fought Mayweather. And from then on, I was kind of hooked in it, but it wasn't, it was just trash talking that got me into it. And some people could say that's a, a strange way, you know, most people it was, it was to fight Nally and it did help. But it was the trash talk. And, and I'm sure for a lot of others, they're going to be getting into boxing. They'll probably be watching these videos, God knows, in a few months or whatever. And, you know, they will have trickled down inevitably from the YouTuber boxing. And I think that's a good thing. Whether you like it or not, you know, I don't mind. Everyone's entitled to their opinion at the end of the day. If you don't like YouTuber boxing, that's absolutely fine. But I don't understand why you'd be complaining about it. Just don't watch it. You know, I, I always say, like, when people say, like, you know oh, I don't want you talking about... Like, people would be silly and they'd comment on these videos and be like, you should, I don't want you talking about that for top of this. It's like, if you don't like me talking about it, just don't flip and watch it. You know, I talk about loads of fighters on here. I talk about news. If there's something that you don't like, just don't watch it. It's always that way because if you watch it and you know it's going to peeve you off, well, 
what why are you surprised that you're peeved off so that's kind of my stance on youtube boxing i know it's there i do think they need to do something though about some of them because some of them do look horrendous in there like they clearly haven't a clue what they're doing i think that the board or misfits or whatever way they're doing it there needs to be some competency test you know just to show that you actually can do anything in a boxing ring because with some of it they look poor they look dangerously poor and boxing you know it's you know you don't play it that's the best way to describe it so i do think they need to do something about that i wouldn't just chuck any old youtuber in they need to have a bit of competency you know maybe get them to do a couple of rounds even against some journeyman just to show that they know what they're doing or can do the bare minimum because just chucking people in there you know at the drop of a hat because he's got a name and all that and they're having a breeze what they're doing that could be dangerous so i would if it, if i had my chance to change one thing about it i would i would introduce that just because for the safety aspect you don't know some of these guys can end up getting seriously hurt because they just don't know what they're doing in terms of everything else as i said i don't really mind it so that's the whole youtuber boxing espn car talked about all right so we'll do the news now rocky fielding i seen this break a few days ago he's announced his retirement at the age of 35 this obviously follows on from his loss just before christmas to dan Azeez. now fielding I mean no disrespect when I say this, but he is the definition of an overachiever because I thought he was a fairly run-of-the-mill British-level fighter. Got knocked out in the round by Callum Smith, I think that was 2015. To go from that to, I think he beat John Ryder for the British title. I think it was John Ryder anyway. And defended it a few times against the likes of David Brophy and people like that. Went over to Germany, fought Tyrone Zoing. I think it was how he pronounced the guy's name. And to get the Alvarez fight off the back of that in Madison Square Garden... You know, it really... If you had told me that in 2015 when he got knocked out by Callum Smith, I'd have laughed at you. I really would have. So, credit to him, you know. Decent career for, for what he's done. What he's been able to achieve in his career with the ability he has. He's overachieved. And, hey, I, I can't complain. He set himself up for life. I'm always happy when I hear that. In terms of Dan Aziz, he's back out now in February. So not long removed from Rocky Fields. That's one thing I like what they're doing with Dan Aziz. They're keeping him active. That's really good that they're keeping him active. Noe Inoue has now confirmed that he's vacated his world titles down there at Bantamweight. He's moving up now to Super Bantamweight. Okay, so those world titles are going to be fragmented. I think, don't be surprised. Like You're going to see people all over the place jumping at 118 pounds trying to get one of those titles. I'm looking forward to seeing how Inoue looks at 122 I really am because I think once he hits 126, he's got to start looking less remarkable. And I, what I mean by that is, is that I don't think we'll see as many highlight reel knockouts. I think he's going to struggle a bit more once he hits about 126 pounds. I mean, look at Nonita Denair. It was really a bantam weight was his best weight. Even at 122, he was still not quite what he was at 118. When he went to 126, although he did win a world title to his credit at 126 pounds, you saw him in there against the likes of Nicholas Walters, Carl Frampton, Jesse Magdaleno, etc. And just, it, it was there for all the world to see. The size gap, the punch and power was there for uh, Nonita Denaire, but it wasn't having the same devastating impact it was at 118 pounds. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens to a new way when he goes to 122. Well, 122, I'd say he'd probably be all right, but 126 is going to be interesting. Luigi Bivol was announced as the Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year for 2022, wins over Canelo Alvarez and Gilberto Ramirez, and I've no issue with that at all. Great year for Dimitri Bivol and two fantastic wins. And Lee Woods, final round, knockout over Michael Conlon, won the Ring Magazine Fight of the Year and Knockout of the Year, respectively. And again, I have no issue with that as well because i think it was the fight of the year and i definitely think it was a there, there was a few there, to be fair like there wasn't actually that many big you know jaw-dropping knockouts but that really that to me was the knockout of the year i, I agree 100 percent with the rings um awards there now let's talk about aj <sighs> anthony joshua jermaine franklin right Anthony Joshua, Jermaine Franklin. So it's reported that Franklin is now the front runner, but no deal is done yet. So Dempsey McKean was being talked about last week, but it's likely not going to be him. So we're talking now about Joshua versus Franklin. Now, 
I said this in the video I did at the time on Friday evening. Well, actually, it was Saturday when I uploaded it, but I did it on Friday. I don't particularly mind Jermaine Franklin as an opponent. Decent hand speed. I think he's going to get barred by Joshua. I don't think his defense is quite on point. I think he's too heavy. I think his stamina is a little bit suspect. And I think he just get found out by Joshua. He you know, he'd take a, a bit of a shellacking because he showed a good chin. So I'd say he'd take a few shots before going down. But I suspect Joshua would just walk straight through him. And I personally think that's what Joshua needs. I really do. Now, you, you could say, Franklin, I could see a case where he might be a little bit tricky for a bit. But I'd say Joshua would still get a big knockout. And then onwards to Dylan White and probably get another big knockout then. I think that's what Joshua needs personally. I think he needs confidence builders. You know, I've seen someone comment. I think it might have been on, I think it was either on one of my videos. It might have been on one of Hatman's videos where... They said basically, I think it was on one of mine as well, where they said basically Joshua needed a rehabilitation job like Lennox Lewis. And yeah, after obviously Lewis lost to McCall. And I agree with that to an extent. And, and what he was referring to was after the Ruiz loss. And I remember at the time thinking, Joshua will beat Ruiz in the rematch, but I'd rather he didn't take it. I'd rather he did do that, rebuild. But the difference between Joshua and Lennox Lewis, Joshua is still fair enough to say he's still a cash cow maybe not the cash cow he was pre-ruiz but he's still a cash cow and he was still at that time so i understand it from a building point of view you want to rebuild them that's the best course of action just take a few steps down a few levels let the scars let the demons go you know get a couple of comeback wins and you're good to go that's what i think they should have done but eddie hearn the zone and anthony joshua as well they know that they're making serious money and they knew how big a release fight would be and how much money they'd get off the back of that and where it would lead to so i can understand from a business point of view why they chose to go down the rematch road i think when you say like lennox lewis did this that was the right way to do it lewis wasn't making or generating the kind of money that joshua was you know he, he just wasn't you know he didn't he had frank maloney managing him i think he had Pan panis Eliades was the guy's name who i think was promoting him and you know they were not they were not matchroom you know they weren't the powerhouse the matchroom were who were looking to or still are who are looking to make the most money and they and again Lennox Lewis wasn't a cash cow then you know he wasn't you could argue in fact I think it's fair to say Frank Bruno was probably a, not a better fighter but a bigger name in the UK certainly certainly I mean he done Wembley Stadium when he fought Oliver McCall so I can see where he's coming from by saying that he needs a, re a Lewis rehabilitation job but Lewis was was given that because he wasn't the star. You know, he didn't... There wasn't all these people eating off Lennox Lewis. You know, that they are with Anthony Joshua. In terms of now... See, now he's 33. So you could argue that it's too little too late. If it happened in 2019, you know, a bit more time. And I, I get that. And that's a fair point. Definitely is. I still... T I think... Look, it's hard to know. I think he's going in the right direction with regards to getting Derek James in. I hope he keeps him. And obviously with regards the opponents, Franklin, White. I'd, I, in truth, I'd like to see him fight maybe a, an Otto Valine, maybe as a third fight. Because I think, I've said about Otto Valine, I wouldn't like him as a first or second opponent. Maybe as a third opponent, he would be a little bit trickier. But maybe it would give Anthony Joshua even a bit more of a confidence builder because he's in there with someone a little bit harder. And then maybe in his fourth fight, you know, a Wilder, a Fury, a, a Hergovic or someone like that, you know, a Joyce. Maybe then, maybe he needs just three fights where it's a, gradual steps. And, I, and again, like, it's a comeback. You know, it is a comeback fight. I don't mind him having an easy... You, don't, you can't be grudge him an easy fight for a comeback fight. You know, it's very different right having it see here's the thing that a lot of people and, and again I, I we know they're saying well well joshua gets a pass for a comeback fight right he gets a pass for an easy comeback fight but um fury doesn't get a pass for chisora well here's the difference here's the big difference right there have been champions throughout the course of history julio cesar chavez jr is a prime example if they wanted an easy fight in their career they took them but you know what they did they had them as non-title fights. Many of them were over 10 rounds. And they weren't on pay-per-view. Right? So when people say, Fury, you're the world champion. Right? So you're the world champion. 
why are you taking an easy fight? Hmm? You know, if, if you say you're the best and you're this, that, and the other, you're all these superlatives, you're the best heavyweight of all time, why are you having Chisora, who has 12 losses at the time, had looked terrible, had, had lost, what was it, three of his last five fights, uh, barely scraped the decision in his last fight, and you put that on pay-per-view and you charge a record price. It's very different than a comeback fight. It's very different. Now, I know it's probably going to be on pay-per-view this. Am I okay with that? Not particularly, but I just know it's the way it is. It's the way it is, unfortunately. But that's the situation with Anthony Joshua likely coming back against Jermaine Franklin April 1st, probably in the O2, I would imagine. So we'll wait and see. Alexander Usyk obviously made the call out to Tyson Fury, calling him Big Belly. And... You know, I've been just the more I think about this fight, the more I think we're going to get it. I really do. I hope we get it because when I look at it, there's no reason why we shouldn't be having it next. I've said that once and I'll say it again. Mandatory seem like they're all good. Hergovic is going to wait, IBF are waiting, letting the WBA have precedent. WBO should be okay. There is no reason why this fight shouldn't be happening. I'm just worried the fact that we're near, we're, we're in the middle of January now. And you don't miss the next two weeks going by. So then we'll be at the end of January going into February. At that point, if we haven't had an announcement, I think it's fair to say it won't be happening in March. Or if it is happening in March, very late March or mid-April. A part of me wants to believe it's going to happen in March, but the more I think about it, a fight of this magnitude, they're going to want to sell the you-know-what out of it. They're going to want to plan ahead. They're going to want to make sure that this has... This makes as much money as they can, that everyone knows about it. And realistically, lads, you're not going to announce a fight of this magnitude with, say, six or five weeks. You're going to want a good eight to ten weeks to get maximum marketing, maximum PR on it, maximum advertising. You know, a fight of this scale. They're going to want to do that. So I reckon March, maybe, question mark, April, May, seriously, April, May, maybe more likely. The more I think about it, maybe more likely. So, but I'm I'm a hundred percent convinced we're getting this. I really am. I, I I felt it since the start, like that, like yeah, furious at this and whatever, whatever. But I've always felt like this fight needs to happen, and I think it will. I think it will. Speaking of other fights that have been announced and announced well in advance, might I add, um, Devin Haney versus Vasily Lomachenko reportedly planned for May the twentieth. Now, i seen Frank, not Frank Warren, uh, Bob Arum talking about this fight. Where is it? Yes, it's going to be for the undisputed lightweight world title. And he said it's not guaranteed that it's going to take place in the US. Now, Madison Square Garden was the name that was being reported. But he says the Middle East are also attempting to host it. That's very interesting. So taking a big fight like that out of Madison Square Garden or out of America and having it in the Middle East to be interesting. Very interested. In terms of Loma versus Haney, I said this once, I'll say it again. I love Lomachenko. I've always enjoyed watching him, but I feel like Devin Haney, it's his time. I think he's improved a lot. I do think, though, like some people would, would make comparisons and say, you know, Loma is, Loma likes the pressure. He's going to be, he's going to have the shorter reach. He is the smaller guy, a bit like Cambosis was. Cambosis hasn't got Lomachenko's footwork for starters. Lomachenko's footwork is still elite level. It's tremendous. And the way he's able to get in just by using good footwork and, you know, apply pressure with that, his, his angles, his movement, it is going to offset Devin Haney. It is. Devin Haney, Devin Haney has improved massively over the last few years. And I think that right now he's young. And bear in mind, right, bear in mind. Devin Haney has wanted Vasily Lomachenko. He's wanted to fight him since before he was champion. Back when I think he was only 20 years old. Like he was calling Lomachenko and wanting to get in the ring and fight him in the summer of 2019. Maybe even before that. So Devin Haney, he has been yearning for this Lomachenko fight. Very similar to how Tiafima Lopez was. And we saw it. Lopez was not to be denied that night. And I think as well, it's going to be the same for Devin Haney. It reminds me... I don't remember when Vitaly Klitschko fought Lennox Lewis. Vitaly Klitschko had been studying Lennox Lewis. He'd been watching Lennox Lewis for a long time. Years, I think he said. So when he went in there against Lennox Lewis that night in 2003, he was as mentally and as ready for Lewis. And Lewis was 
the polar opposite. Because Lewis was looking at down other roads. There was talk. I remember at the time there was talk of him fighting Mike Tyson again. And Lewis was near the end anyway. Whereas Klitschko was looking at Lewis like, I want you. I want to fight you and I want to beat you. And I think it's going to be the same for Devin Haney. You know, again, if you look at... This is the difference between Haney and a Tank Davis. You know, Tank Davis won his world title in 2017. And they constantly him and Mayweather more so Mayweather I look I think Tank would have taken the fight but I just think Floyd and maybe the people behind Floyd Ellaby they just seemed unwilling to even attempt to make a Lomachenko fight which is annoying whereas you look at Devin Haney anything he could have done to make the Lomachenko fight he would have done even when well even having a title he was like I want Lomachenko he wanted to fight Lomachenko so he's going to be going in there thinking, right, well, this is what I want. I've gone to top rank to get this fight. I've done everything I've, I've needed to do to get this fight. Now I have it, and I'm taking this opportunity with both hands. I don't think Devin Haney will be denied. Personally, I, I think he's going to beat Lomachenko. I really do. Now, this is a bit of a worry. Ryan Garcia's promoter, Oscar De La Hoya, has revealed they've not received the contract from Javante Tank Davis for the fight, despite the fight being a done deal. So he said... Um, so has set a deadline, a public deadline for Monday and claims they will move on if they don't have it by then. <sighs> Jesus Christ. I really hope that this fight gets made. I like this fight. I want to see this fight. I mean, it went from it being made one minute to now it's not being made and now there's a deadline until tomorrow. Please, we had enough of this last year. This is a great fight. Let's have this fight. Whose fault is it? Well, I, I'm pretty sure De La Hoya said it was signed. So don't be saying it's signed if it's not signed. I don't know. I would, I'm not even going to assume whose fault it is. I don't know. But please, for the love of God, just get this fight over the line. It's a fight that we all want to see in boxing. I think it's a great fight. Both undefeated. Both hungry. Both have a point to prove. I think it'll be a great fight. I really, truly do. I think it will be absolutely fantastic. I really just hope we get to see it. That's what I really hope we just get to see. I just want to see a fight. Um, God, I really hope we do. So that's my main thoughts on that. That's pretty much the bulk of the news. I don't want review of the week to go on too long. I will timestamp, obviously, of course. So yeah. That's pretty much that. Obviously, Liam Smith. I'll probably preview that more on midweek report, actually, than I will tonight. But Liam Smith versus um, Eubank Jr. is happening on Saturday. Live watch along. Stay tuned for that. I was hoping to get my prediction video out today. It was probably going to be out tomorrow when said. So I might upload this. What time is it now? 10 to 9. Might upload this this evening, actually. I upload this this evening and then upload preview tomorrow if I have a thumbnail on time. There was a few issues with that thumbnail, so it looks good, but it just was um, the wrong Liam in it. So um, we'll get that fixed and then we'll hopefully have that tomorrow. But yeah, that's my thoughts on everything. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope that everyone has a great week. I've got a busy week planned. I do. I have a um, eventful week in store. I have a big event coming up on Tuesday. Wish us all luck with that, lads. And hopefully I'll have some more events as well. And when I say events, I'm not talking about boxing events. I'm talking about life events. Um, so wish us luck with that on Tuesday. And yeah, everything else, it, it's been going well. You know, things are going pretty good. Can't wait to go over to London. Hopefully I get to see Yard Baturbiev. And yeah, things, are, th things aren't too bad. You know, things aren't too bad. I, I had an interesting week this week. I had an interesting week, you know, this this week, I'm, I'm going off on one here, but let's call it a monologue, why not, some people like them, it's only going to be brief, but um, I got some news this week, uh, some good news, and I remember um, one day, I was going to go gym, but I ended up having to do shopping instead, and I heard some stuff that happened in my old job, and all I thought of was, karma, 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 chameleon, because he, People will know there was a lot of things happened there and left me. Well, one specific thing, it left me just absolutely just in a really bad way. So here, and I don't wish ill health on anyone or anything like that. And it wasn't, it was a bit of a longer story, which I'll go into. But 
I remember just hearing that thinking, just just don't be a you know what the people. That's all I thought of when I was like, don't be a you know what the people and, and stuff like that won't happen. You know? So that was the story there. That was my week in a nutshell. I hope you all have a great one this week. Like I said, I've got a lot on this week. If anyone else has a lot on this week, I hope it all goes well. I hope someone or all of you, whoever the however many thousand listen, will get some good news as well. I hope you all do. I hope you have a great week, people. For now, I'll leave you with that. Smash the like button if you could. Hit subscribe, of course, if you haven't already. People, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. Oh, yeah. We will do a live tomorrow. And hopefully I'll have a guest on. Not tomorrow now, but later on in the week. Hopefully I'll have a guest on one of the lives. So we might have two lives this week. Could we go on, babe? We could have two lives this week and a watch along. So really, I went through a dull phase of not doing enough lives. We could have three this week. Seriously. Hope you enjoyed it, people. Smash the like button on the way out. Hit subscribe, of course. As always, I'll talk to you. Peace.